Hi everyone, how are you today? Good? By any chance, did, except for this small group uh, over here, did someone die in your family recently? Except me? Why? I mean, what's the matter with you today? Uh, was it because of the exam? Probably not. So, okay, let's share up. So today, uh, unfortunately, we are still uh, <clears throat> having to do what, what we got to do. Uh, so we are going to have a lecture. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, uh, next week, the following week, we're not going to have any class uh, uh, again because there's Children's Day holiday. Uh, so that's the actually reason why we <clears throat> had a, the one week uh, delayed the final exam schedule. If not, uh, we would have uh, finished our final exam on June 9th instead of June uh, 16, wasn't it? Uh, anyway, so, okay, so make sure that uh, next week you are also, uh, again, you are going to be able to uh, have a free uh, Friday evening. So just put up, let's just put up with this one for a moment and then uh, that will be all right. So today, uh, we are going to continue on this evolutionary thing scheme and uh, take a look at the speciation. Uh, I have mentioned several uh, occasions during the lecture until now, but uh, today we are going to take a look at some of the actual the mechanism under the title of speciation because the significance of this speciation is in that that is the something that culminating in the final result of the the new occurrence of the evolution so evolution once again culminates in with or well, maybe culminates in the speciation that's what uh maybe we can say about it so then there are two big uh, class or category of uh speciation one is called the micro uh, evolution and the other one is a macro evolution both of which probably intuitively you may be able to sense okay what's which one is which micro versus macro everyone uh, probably uh, should be able to understand so in micro evolution uh, which still lagging this my iPad is still portraying the previous screen while this screen is already ahead of okay now <laughs> Jeez. so this microevolution uh, here try to portray some variation like 75% 25% 71% 29% I don't know what that means probably uh, but in the left side uh, we try to depict uh, macro evolution, the big, several different kinds of uh, dinosaur. Thank God they are no longer with us. Uh, but uh, these are the one long, long time ago uh, were wandering <coughs> on the on this land. So anyway, uh, this macro evolution as a result of this macro evolution, which the picture tried to tries to describe that there are several big different kinds of this, what are the, those are things, animals or whatever, plants or organism. So here, uh, macro evolution uh, result in actual the differentiation into different, quite distinct different species. So maybe this macro evolution is the one that uh, produces different species. Then what about this microevolution? Does microevolution also contribute to creating any new species is probably the question. Okay. So anyway, first off, what's the difference here? By just taking a look at this uh, figure, what do you think that the difference between the main difference between macro versus microevolution. What do you think? The big versus the small? Obviously, literally. Oh, yes. Like, 
Ja. So you are what you're saying is this is something that occurring still uh, within the species within the same species. So maybe in the end, over a long period of time, if you just keep doing this, maybe you get to what you want, which is the, if that's the speciation, but not you're not there yet. Whereas this macro evolution, you actually achieved what you want in terms of this evolution so that the different species uh, result in exactly you're right. Correct. Thank you. So that's the difference. Uh, so micro evolution, uh, what we can say about is adaptation, like individuals within a species, like we asked, maybe, maybe within this population, uh, every individual, uh, all of us, uh, is trying to do to, at, to their best, trying to do something like any adapt, uh, adaptation uh, activity. Uh, so then as a result, uh, you create some variation, small variation. Uh, you inherited, every one of us inherited some differences in the gene makeup, obviously. So that's why uh, everyone looks different, everyone also behaves differently, and etc. cetera. Um, and with that, what you have, you are trying, during the course of your, I mean, trying to do uh, your best, and you are, uh, differentiating, like you are expanding these differences. So that's what we can say about the microevolution, so adaptation uh, activity. So in other words, good, good thing is, <clears throat> because this is something that happening during very short period of time in terms of this evolutionary uh, time scale. So you can even uh, observe this occurring microevolution even in the simulatory uh, the laboratory setting, you can observe, okay, something, you can follow the changes. So that's what we call this a microevolution. But no matter how hard you try, and no matter how magnificent, exciting result you get as a result of this microevolution, uh, that alone uh, is not about at all about the evolution of a new species, of, of, Unfortunately. So, hey, where are you going to fall? Still is that this stupid guy. Okay, so on the other hand, this macro evolution, uh, uh, as I said, is a synonymous to speciation. So it will uh, create actual speciation. Uh, so this Dividing things. This is a really big word containing sentence. Uh, it's the origin of the division of the taxonomy hierarchy. What is that? Taxonomy hierarchy. Taxonomy hierarchy is uh, what uh, this was uh, all about this whole thing. The taxonomic hierarchy, some differences. Well, hey. So don't be scared. Uh, of such a big word, just nothing. So it's division in terms of classification uh, scheme, uh, this macro evolution will create some different blocks okay, that each of uh, blocks can be distinguished from the rest is what probably what we can say. So not that much. Uh, and another important thing is, uh, there's no way you can actually uh, observe actual uh, happening of this macro evolution because it takes really, really long period of time. Follow me, please. Yeah. So, uh, so this macro evolution, even Darwin, uh, who was the inventor of this theory of revolution, thought about it and then created his own notes, uh, something very similar to this taxonomic, so to speak, that taxonomic hierarchy branching pattern. And another thing is, 
one example of such macroevolution, uh, the present day modern elephant. Hello. Hello. Okay. Modern elephants were actually the result of a most relatively recent breakup, uh, starting from more ancient form of uh, uh, this original it's called mastodon, pally mastodon, and with some several branching, some of them uh, all gone extinct, and now we have this present day elephants. So this is another recently observed uh, consequence of such macroevolution, but uh, in general, you can't really observe those uh, macro evolution. So, this getting back to what we have already mentioned, the criteria of distinguishing, dividing two different separate species is, especially in case of animals, uh, the it depends on the reproductive isolation like whether can they interbreed together or can they not is the criteria about distinguishing separating these two things whether they are within the same species or uh, members of different species so this interbreeding things so that's what uh, we call the biological species concept uh, then the question is why why two individuals can't interbreed like let's just stick on to let's focus on only animal case. Why two uh, randomly picked two individuals can not be made to breed to produce viable offspring because they are too different. But how? Why? If we just keep asking, okay, like, can we actually provide some systematic and reasonable answer to why can? some members, some individual, can they interbreed? Is the question, okay. So, there are several different reasons as they put them as a mechanisms, but there are some reasons, right? There are several reasons uh, for uh, some of the individual cannot interbreed. And we, the people uh, love always have some kind of a organization. So we just grew several different regions as a mechanism, as a reproductive isolation into two big groups. Uh, one is called the pre-zygotic and the other one is a post, pre versus a post. Is what? Before and after. Zygotic, what's zygotic? So fertilization, sperm and eggs, so there may be some reasons in some occasions, there are some specific reasons uh, that kept this particular sperm and egg cannot even be fused together, which what we describe as a fertilization. So fertilization cannot occur. Then we call this as a, some of the prezygotic barrier. Yeah, we can intuitively we can think of several reasons. And on the other hand, even after they successfully have this uh, combining event, fertilization okay, went through well, succeeded, but still, even after that, something happened. Yeah, always, all this shit happens, sorry. But so the follow-up cannot be achieved okay, uh, as they wished. So then we call, distinguish them as a post zygotic barriers. What else? These are kind of really straightforward. Maybe you take a look at these at first, or oh, oh, there's gotta be some kind of confusion, very complex things that I need to really study hard uh, in order not to get confused. No, if you really sit down and think about it, this, it's just, childish reason. Of course, there are always some reasons like pre 
some of the reasons uh, are there uh, to prevent some event happening and some other reasons after that event that we wish to uh, occur even happen, then some of the reason might actually pre uh, interfere the following step. So that's it. The pre-zygotic barrier versus post-zygotic barriers are such that. Having said that, even without, even without we just uh, looking at the uh, next following slide, can we even predict what kind of pre-zygotic barriers would exist actually in reality? Can anyone think of? Yeah, it's all also like based on logic. As long as we think about logically, we can always uh, arrive at reasonable answers. You don't have to be a rocket scientist <laughs> to have such answers. Just so, what kind of uh, is there any such mechanism that you can think of? Yes. Uh -huh. So, which means like some of the biochemical differences will actually block even the entry of a sperm into this. Yeah, if that's actually something they recognize, yeah, that is absolutely some such prezygotic barriers, of course, right? So we can think of many such examples, different mechanisms. That is my point. Anything that prevents that this actual event, okay, sperm and an egg having uh, together, meet together and fuse to, uh, to form a zygote, fertilize the egg, anything, then it will be okay, considered as prezygotic barriers. So in other words, uh, if we try to just by reading, looking at what's described, what's on the textbook, and then try to memorize, oh, these are pre-zygotic barriers. What a silly way of uh, having such information. Just to relax, oh, okay, anything. We can think of any kind of mechanism that, as a consequence, this sperm and egg have a difficulty to have a such uh, encounter, then, that must be a pre -zygote. And also, reasonably, our common sense will dictate that even after that, there are lots of tens of thousands of, I'm exaggerating, tens of thousands different reasons that something can go wrong even after that. Then that will all something like post zygotic barrier. But one premise, one important premise is what? Such thing should be consistent. It's not something that happening only once in a while, but it's got to be always a systematically at least there so that we can reasonably predict that will always happen, that such interference will always there. So because of that, these two particular individuals, there is no chance that these two particular individuals will have a successful such interbreeding. As long as we recognize, acknowledge that, then that's it, okay? So, uh, if you are with me on that, then uh, we almost actually finish uh, one of the most important subject topics of the, uh, the today's lecture. So anyway, so, with that, several, like something, habitat isolation, temporal isolation, behavior isolation, and mechanical isolation, gametic isolation. Hmm. So all these belong to one of those pre-zygotic barriers, whatever they are. Okay. But by just by looking at the, the title, we can still anticipate what's 
exactly they are. Habitat isolation. What do you think that would be? They're living too far away, these two. So there is no chance for these two uh, individuals have any kind of chance of having any meeting. If, don't, if you don't have any such chance, then you forget about it. And so even if you are physically kind of compatible, your sperm and your, uh, the, your partner, prospective partner's ex, uh, physically, um, biochemically compatible, if they don't have any chance to have such opportunity, then it will never occur. Maybe that's one example might be something like a ti uh, tiger versus a lion. Tiger versus tiger and a lion, because they are na their natural habitats are all, always like a far away, remote. So they wouldn't even think about having such mating event. Maybe. But anyway, uh, several very specific examples uh, you can find and, and easily on the internet and also on any regular biology textbook so will describe. But instead of digging into more specifics by understanding the concept, then we can forget about any details because those details are such as details, trivial. And on the other hand, temporal, what do you mean temporal? Time-wise. Time is a location versus a time, timing. So we can imagine such a timing incompatibility of such a meeting event, uh, any such existence would, okay, to potential participants of those uh, meeting will, uh, will, will be discouraged by such uh, the interference and behavior also. If these two individuals, members of two different species, uh, they don't look any, any kind of uh, the compatible or the, uh, the, the feeling of uh, acceptance in terms of their culture or behavior, then they wouldn't even attempt to have such mating uh, activity or behavior. We can easily under, understandably so. Even that can, uh, that exists even widespread in our human society too. So uh, even although physically such a mating event can always occur, but always this behavior or culture will uh, <clears throat> present some such uh, actual existing the block. And so is the case of this actual nature for other animals. And mechanical, physically, now it's a, they are structurally. Structurally, the mating cannot possible is what probably mechanical. What do you mean mechanical? So this, the, the sperm and eggs has to meet, but physically these two body shapes are impossible for such event. No way. And gametic isolation is also even this very similar to what this lady uh, described, that even the no block, no interference, no barriers exist, but still uh, at the final stage, this sperm and egg have some very fine detailed reasons so that they cannot really fuse themselves together because of whatever the pH matter or some other incompatibility or some, in some other times actually, the foreign, species sperms are like immediately get killed by some toxic uh, unprepared substances present in the eggs. Okay. So if that was the case, a sperm uh, is not compatible. Like, so many such reasons will uh, exist there. And on the other hand, these post zygotic barriers are, uh, as I have, So that happened, fertilization happened. 
but the result of the fertilization has some disadvantage, then as a consequence, the mating event will not be successful. So what I mean, such as, for example, is like this hybrid have a viability problem. So any offspring uh, resulting from this hybrid mating cannot really survive very uh, well, this viability problem. And some other times this hybrid doesn't have any big obvious viability, so they can be healthy, uh, as healthy as others. But in the end, this fertility problem, so th th they cannot produce very well of their own offspring, then eventually this will be another failure. Uh, so this is another such thing that we can reasonably uh, imagine, okay, that could be possible. And also, Something called the hybrid breakdown is, uh, it is, it's not really common in animal field, but in uh, more common in the plant field, in crop field. So once you have this hybrid, then breakdown is, it is not something really obviously is a viability problem or fertility problem, but has some other, uh, some other ambiguous problems so this hybrid cannot really make uh, cannot really survive very well is what we actually categorize this as hybrid breakdown okay let's get into that later so so we do have some especially even in the captivity uh, we can have some of the uh, very rare hybrid, as we can see this uh, tiger and the leopard, and the hybrid, the offspring between these two uh, cat species, uh, it's called a leopone. Uh, in this case, even they don't seem to have any such a viability problem. And the fertility problem is like a mixed uh, bag of the result. But still, in nature, they don't. They don't really, uh, for many reasons. Maybe some of the fertility problems, so they don't uh, really. Or maybe actually, in the first place, they have some kind of a behavior problem. Why would any leopard will have any uh, dare to have a mate with the tiger or vice versa? So that is another uh, consequences, and. The very famous case of this fertility problem, uh, we can see uh, easily see in the case of the yeah, mating hybrid between the horse and donkey. So, like this horse and donkey's mating, depending on which one's uh, female and which one's male, uh, we do have a different uh, names. Like the most uh, common mule is actually uh, the hybrid between the female horse and the male donkey, whereas the male horse and the female donkey's hybrid, uh, we call it as a hinny. But in both the cases, whether it's a mule or a hinny, they have a serious fertility problem, so they are sterile. So in this case, we also exactly know why they have a fertility problem, because uh, they're Chromosome number is different. The horse and donkey's chromosome number is different. To, to explain more clearly, I have to actually uh, also explain the this two terminology of Sooner or later, I have to actually uh, do this. So I will do this explanation now, today. Diploid versus haploid. To uh, put it bluntly, straightforward, you know, we are, our cell, uh, 
our normal body cell, uh, which is diploid in terms of a chromosome number. So diploid haploid is uh, something that uh, terminal, terminology describing the status, status of our chromosome number in the cell. And how many chromosomes, uh, does anyone know that how many chromosomes we have as a human? Each human cell, how many chromosome number do we have? Hmm? 52? 32? 23? 22? Wow, we have a lot of mutants. <laughs> Which one is that? 23? So someone will say human chromosome have, uh, we have 46 chromosome number. Some other will say, no, it's not. We have 23 chromosome number. Which one is correct? What do you mean on the separate things, chromosome itself? Oh, no, it's not actually. Two kinds of legs we only get to observe during a very particular timing during the cell division. That's not what I, uh, is. yeah, it, it, we can easily get confused about that, but uh, it's not. But anyway, yeah, uh, we are getting there. 23 versus 46, both of them can be correct uh, depending on the circum different circumstances. In terms of a sheer number wise, sheer number of chromosome, we have a 46 chromosome in our normal body cell, 46, it's 46. However, uh, if someone asks differently, how many unique chromosomes do you have in every body cells? The answer should be 23. What do you mean unique versus 46? If we had 23 unique chromosome, but all together total chromosome number is 46, what do I mean by that? That means every unique chromosome, per each unique chromosome, we have another double copy, replica. That is the case. But how? How do we end up this 46? But all these 46 tools are actually two of each 46 uh, are always the identical, so to speak, same kind of chromosome. Why? Why is that? Because this 23 chromosome set we get from who? Your father. And another 23 exact same 23 chromosome, we get them from our mother. We are, or what? All of our body cells are a result of what? The fertilized egg. Fertilized egg kept dividing, 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 and voila. Okay. So all of this descendant of the fertilized egg, because this 23 chromosome was there in sperm, and another 23 chromosome was in the egg, and the fertilizing event combined these two 23 chromosomes together to create 46. And these 46 chromosomes are normal, our normal status. So here, getting back to these two different terminologies, diploid versus haploid. Diploid means having two sets of chromosomes. So between 46 versus 23, which one is our diploid chromosome number? The human, in the case of a human. Is it 46 or 23? Diploid. Oh my gosh. 46 is our diploid chromosome number. So when we see 46 chromosome, then oh, this is a diploid cell. And our normal body cells. If every cell of human body are all 46 chromosome number, then there is no need for us to try to distinguish the difference between diploid and haploid. 
But unfortunately, in some occasions, some cells have only half the number of chromosomes. Guess what? What kind of cells in our body will have only half of the chromosome? Those cells, those cells that have the half number of the chromosome we call as a gamete. Gamete is what? Sex cells. Examples of gametes, sperm and eggs. They are gametes. In our body, not both of them, but at least we have one of two kinds of, two possible kinds of a gamete, right? Then all these gametes are the haploid. So during the fertilization event, this haploid gametes combine and they restore the diploid number after becoming a fertilized egg, right? And all these body, normal body cells, are the descendants of this, the initial fertilized egg, which is the first diploid cell. That's how we go as a human. And obviously, chromosome numbers are different. Okay. So something maybe, I, I don't really quite remember correctly, but chimpanzee is a diploid chromosome number might be something different in that maybe they may have a 48 or 44, I don't know. But it's obvious, obviously they've got to be different chromosome number. And the point that I brought this diploid versus haploid is that in the case of donkeys and horse, exactly that is the case. The chromosome number between this diploid chromosome number between don and donkeys and horses are not uh, identical, something slightly different. Okay. Maybe 36 versus 34 or something that uh, maybe you can easily uh, look them up uh, during the break. What's the exact diploid chromosome number for horse and a donkey? Then what's the problem? What's the problem? Because, so, as I explained, this body, normal body cell, everyone knows that uh, when it comes to a ripe time, then each different individual will produce their version of a gamete, sperm or eggs, right? Through some very special kind of cell division. So the procedure by which this gamete is produced is some very special kind of cell division event. Uh, its name, although name is always not important, but uh, such special kind of cell division is called myosis. That whereas Regular, so this is regular cell division, straightforward, splitting into two, you copy, exactly copy and split into two kind of a straightforward, so to speak, regular or standard cell division. We call that as what? Mitosis. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, So all our body cells are a result of this so-called mitosis, whereas this sperm or eggs are the result of meiosis. The difference is through meiosis, the end result is you have the half the number of chromosomes, 23. All of a sudden, your original, your parental cell was 46 in chromosome number, and to produce sperm or an egg, the result is you end up in having only the half the number of a chromosome, which is the haploid number in every sperm and egg 
cells. So in other words, reducing, reducing original chromosome, the amount, original chromosome number-wise, chromosome number into exact half is extremely important for the successful meiosis. For your survivability, for your longevity, for long-term survival, because everyone wants to live forever, then producing viable sperm and eggs is extremely critical, isn't it? So this, uh, every individual, every individual considered this event is extremely, extremely important event. You're just reducing this. What do you think? In this reduction, first, first question would be very straightforward to every one of us. Why is it necessary? Why do we have to reduce the number of chromosomes into half? when it comes to producing gamete. And anyone? Why? Anybody except for those uh, French speaking lady? <laughs> Sorry. Anyone? Why do we have to? Why do we have to worry about reducing, this is a really complicated matter. We have to reduce chromosome number into half to produce viable gamete. But why? Why do we have to worry? What if we don't? What if a kind of, well, what the heck, we neglect. What if we, we neglect its reduction? What's going to, what's, what is going to happen? Let's say accidentally, like a very lazy uh, person, totally neglected this reduction of a criminal number. So uh, this person's, huh? what? Okay, sorry. So have uh, the sperm on X chromosome number uh, has 46 instead of 23. So then what's going to happen? If these two, if these two individuals, sperm and egg, meet and have a fertilization event, then consequences those fertilized eggs will have how many chromosomes? Instead of 46, they will have what? 92. So is this fertilized egg that deployed? No more. It's going to be what? How would you call such accidental ploid number? Quadra tetra. We call that as a tetraploid. Yeah, it exists in nature. Although very, very rare in animal, this tetraploid, some plants, some plants, many plants are very lazy. So they don't care. So they produce, they don't produce very carefully about this half the number of chromosomes. So they end up this tetraploid. Okay. So in animal, uh, you can't, you, you cannot really do that. So this having it, it reduced number of chromosomes is extremely important. So to give you an, uh, the final version of the answer of this why question, because Otherwise, we will have, uh, uh, so to speak, abnormal number of chromosomes in the fertilized egg. So, so maybe some of you may think, hey, isn't more the better? Yeah, you, we, uh, we end up four instead of two. So, like, let's enjoy. We have two more extra. No, it's not. That's a disaster. So those animals uh, cannot, usually cannot survive. So even, for example, case in point, Down syndrome. Ever heard of it? Down syndrome. Down syndrome is right, uh, caused by having three chromosomes instead of two in chromosome number 21. So maybe you think, hey, we have a three chromosome in chromosome number uh, 21, so instead of two, so more the better, we have one more extra. Why would be the problem? It's a big problem, as you can see. 
So having more extra number of chromosomes, uh, not necessarily, or I shouldn't I say not necessarily, is almost always result in disaster rather than blessing. Okay, so this is very important. So you have to absolutely you have to reduce your what you have originally into the half so that to prepare the next following event of reuniting. So that after reunification, you go back to what you had, restore, so to speak, that deployed number of chromosomes. Okay. So exact this having in order to have this. Okay. So this having the exact half the number of chromosomes uh, uh, is sometimes very straightforward, but when you had this two fertilized hybrid event between donkey and horse, your original chromosome number was not identical. So you mix them, combine together, and then try to produce the gamete, which is the half the amount of the chromosome number. That is impossible to have the half. That's why this, whether the mule or a hinnies are all sterile, because they cannot exactly half the number of chromosome in their sperm and eggs. So that's the reason. Uh, so to explain that, I spent too long, but that's important anyway, I had to do. The second part of this question regarding this reduction is more important. What else? Just simple number-wise, simple number-wise reduction like having Reducing, hey, cut it out into half. You have 46, just automatically you reduce into 23. Would it be enough or is there some more very delicate caretaking necessary? What do you think here? You have a 46 chromosome, but your task in order to produce viable sperm or eggs, you have to reduce this number into exact half but is there any very, very specific care in that procedure? Is that something, oh, it's very easy. Why, you, why do you have to worry? So let's say we have a 46, exactly whatever they are, 46, just cut into this left half, okay, you, you 23, you go to this room, and another 23, you go to the other room. That's it? Fine. Is that it? Or something, there is a, some... Uh, more detailed, delicate things that we need to take care of. Of course, the latter is the case. So, if you are simply reduced number blindly, the risk that you are going to uh, have to worry about is this 46, each, what if you end up in one cell in one cell, you have two chromosome number one. Number-wise, you're right, you have 23. But this exact same chromosomes are represented together uh, twice in a given sperm. That means instead of that chromosome number one present double, then something is entirely missing in this cell. That is absolutely chaotic disaster. So you should prevent such accident. In other words, you have to really, really make sure that every, in this sperm, not only the number, not only the sheer number 23, but also more importantly, every, every chromosome must be here. No one is left out. So no extra. No missing, exactly half. So entire genome. Like I said, this 46 is the result of each chromosome existing double in double. So each one chromosome should be here and another set of chromosome uh, should be in other cell, in other sperm or other egg cell. Is exactly technical difficulty. Is there any way 
Is there any very good way of uh, accomplishing such very delicate task? We have a 46 individual. 23 of these 46 so are all identical twins, right? Then we are going to, we are going to separate our identical twin population. 23 identical twins are present here. We are going to divide our identical twin, 23, into each separate room, so that in each room, only one of the two identical twins, or every twins, are present in each room. That is the task of generating this gamete. How can we do that? Anyone? This one is so important, so I will. Plus one, I will try to give you an incentive. Plus one point. If anyone can describe, can offer the solution of how can we successfully separate each identical twin into two separate rooms. That's what we are going to do. Yeah. By the way, I bought because I noticed that these markers are all just crappy, so I even uh, from my pocket I bought today and then this one doesn't even look uh, better. So anyway, anyone? Dividing identical twins. Five seconds. Yes. Duplicate. And? Uh, they are already identical twins. So they are, uh, so to speak, in a duplicated form. They are already in identical twins. 46 individuals, but 23 different identical twins. So they are already duplicated. So you mean these 46 identical twins, another duplication so that have a, we have a four identical twins for each kind? That's kind of a, a little bit of a more confusing. Okay, anybody else? Yes? Yeah, exactly. This is meiosis, isn't it? This meiosis. How do we successfully, how do we make sure the correctly separating chromosome during meiosis is my actual question, my intention. At 46, but if, if we don't really do carefully this is separating, then in one cell, double some of the same kind of chromosome may end up. Yeah, and on a, in another cell, as a consequence, another cell, that chromosome is entirely missing. That's not what we want. We have to, like, that's why I just brought up this uh, analogy of identical twin. So each twin, each twin should be separated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly happened, but in, in terms of this a cellular event, in, in the in in the scale of a cell, like it's a it's, it's being carried out during the course of a cell division, right? So one cell, 46 already, this uh, this cell existing parent cell had a 46 chromosome number. Now this cell will this cell will divide into two. Not fission, but they go away, yeah. 46. 
split into 23. This is basically what you have to do during meiosis, okay? How can you make sure that exactly same kind, each exactly? Maybe I'm trying to make this too difficult, difficult looking. Maybe it's just too simple, but uh, one easy way to make sure such in, in these two rooms, each of two different kinds are always separated is like in dance, when you have this ballroom, then you always have a specific partner, right? Then you have, you make sure that each partner consists of this twin, identical twin as a partner. You line up, each partner line up. So these two partner, make sure, hold together. Okay, don't go away, you are my partner. Now, everybody, okay, make sure that everybody has your own partner, yeah, make sure. Then now, this line will be separated. Then each, each identical twin go to this different room. That's how you do it. In other words, this partner, another terminology we call as a homologous chromosome. We do have this homologous chromosome. 46. Each in 46 chromosome, each 23 different kinds of chromosome, each, and they have homologous pattern, homologous chromosome. So in other words, each 23 different kinds of chromosome, we do have a two, each of them, two homologous chromosomes. Why? Because half, once again, another half, we have uh, the one half, we get it from mother, and on the other half, we got it from father. That's why. That's the origin of this so-called homologous chromosome. Sperm and eggs basically contain kind of this identical kind of chromosome, 23. Chromosome, starting from chromosome number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 22, and X, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 22, and Y, kind of. And then you combine these two. Restore 46. So then, chromosome number one. There is a chromosome number one, another chromosome number one. These two chromosome number ones are homologous chromosome. Chromosome number two, there is another chromosome number two. And these two chromosome number twos are homologous chromosome. Only chromosome, have a different kind or shape in special occasion is between X chromosome and Y chromosome. You ladies don't worry about because you ladies have a two identical X chromosome. But in my case, I have one Y chromosome and one X chromosome, but these X and Y chromosomes are technically considered as a homologous chromosome. But if you take a look at one X chromosome, one Y chromosome, they don't really at all look alike. But still, since they line up each other, facing together during this ballroom dance, so they, that's why they are considered as homologous, X and Y. Okay, so by using this technique, we can correctly separate all these, each different homologous chromosome into two separate room. And that is a really extreme, extremely important event uh, should occur during this special cell division we call uh, meiosis. Uh, so the point was the reason an animal, especially in animal, the hybrids, 
have a difficulty of uh, fertility is because of this, the gamete chromosome number is not compatible. Okay? So once you have this mixture, hybrid cell, then when it comes to splitting up on together or once again in the production of the gamete, you, there is physically, it is not possible at all to have exact half the number of uh, chromosome sets because you don't have any homologous. You don't have exact identical homologous partner in such a hybrid cell. That is uh, the point that what I am trying to explain the reason, is a reason. Okay, so hybrid breakdown is, uh, at first generation of the hybrid, it looks all okay. Okay, good, good, good. Even like stronger, bigger. Sometimes we just describe it as a hybrid, uh, hybrid level bigger. But then suddenly the, the generation afterward break down all this. Viability wise and the size wise and, and the sterility. So feeble and sterile, uh, sterile usually. Uh, then how, how are we going to describe, explain this? Oh, I don't know. It's very confusing. Let's put it as a hybrid breakdown. Uh, so that's uh, frequently observed during the, uh, the, the crop. The crop species, different crop species, including rice and barley and some other very important food crops. And the first generation of hybrid is very strong, viable, vigor, and then the next generation afterwards is always create a problem. So uh, having, trying to have a, trying to develop a better, more useful hybrid is very difficult technically because of the presence of such hybrid breakdown. Uh, okay. So one obvious, the closing uh, remark about this uh, mode of speciation is that one obvious such uh, mode of speciation, reproductive isolation mechanism is probably this geographical uh, separation. If two groups of populations are like separate, like geographically far too away, or there is a, some very uh, insurmountable the geographical barrier, like a big mountain or a big, uh, <coughs> like ocean in between, etc. Then obviously, even if they are comparable, but uh, their mating will just keep. Uh, they cannot mate, so this generating hybrid will be prevented. And eventually, these two group of population will develop and evolve into two. Uh, two different and uh, two different species, okay? However, uh, as we have seen these other possible, the reproductive isolation mechanism, and even without such obvious geographical separation, a lot of times this uh, speciation is possible, is the point of what we have seen. So, Allopatric, sympatric is about all about the geographical species, but this is a two uh, technical terminology. So I will skip. Why should we care about allopatric, a sympatric speciation? As a, so forget it. Let's forget about this. The next thing is now we have briefly tasted this ploidy. So let's take a look at this polyploidy. So when, it, when we consider this our human cell as a diploid, that means having two full sets of a chromosome. The definition wise, a diploid means having two full sets of a chromosome. And it is very uh, generally natural scenario for most of this, the organisms existing as a diploid. Why? Because 
the sexual reproduction event, uh, uh, after all, occur uh, through this mating, fertilization between sperm and an egg, right? So having one set of chromosome, each individual having one set of chromosome in the case of a gamete, combined together to form having two full sets of chromosome, which we call as a diploid, fine. But how come in some occasions having more than diploid? Like as we have seen, tetraploid is possible, sometimes it's possible, because uh, if you uh, are not careful enough about this producing this gamete, then uh, obviously you can easily end up in tetraploid instead of this diploid. So that type of incidence we recognize as a polyploid. So, uh, this is very uh, prevalent, widespread in plant kingdom, surprisingly. So having this diploid is convention, uh, by convention, we designate them as a 2N. Here the N is their unique chromosome number. So if we apply this thing in human, the N should be how many? In the case of human, N should be 23, right? So by put 2N, which will be calculated into 46, we know, okay, 2N is a diploid. So N is unique in each different species because each different species have a unique chromosome number. N is a haploid chromosome number. So 2N is a diploid. And meiosis, through meiosis, you should create N, right? Why always is lagging? Cannot really stand. Okay, now. So if this was, so to speak, regular or normal, meiosis, okay. this gamete should create haploid number of chromosome. Right? However, something happened, so such reduction division, meiosis, there, is, there was a problem, so you still end up having diploid egg and sperm, as I have explained shortly before. Then if these two gametes combined together to form a fertilized egg, now you have, you end up tetraploid instead of original diploid. That's how you easily create tetraploid individual. And like I said, it's very widespread in plants. It happens a lot, okay? And sometimes even this odd number of, instead of an even number, the multiplication of twos, two, four, eight, but sometimes through this type of combinatorial mechanism, sometimes, although it's not uh, as uh, common as the, uh, the tetraploid, but this triploid individual is also possible. But it is possible, but how it is possible is not really. Uh, I have shown you once, but you don't really have to memorize. You, you can always try to think, how can it be possible, and then correctly end up uh, correct answer. And the reason why plants are more widespread in such polyploid is because in animal, once you have such tetraploid or triploid, and the result in the individual is just a they cannot survive because of having too many chromosomes. But for some reason, plants uh, seem to be more tolerant. Oh, it's okay. No big deal. What the heck? Uh, I will survive. And that allowed plants have more widespread uh, polyploid. So like, uh, maybe Upside, at least uh, seemingly, upside of a polyploid is usually they are bigger polyploid. 
And especially what we are actually interested in in plant is like a bigger, uh, bigger fruits. After, after all, that what we want. And through this delivered, delivery uh, production of the tetraploid by simply we are trying to allow them to have more and more tetraploid and even bigger uh, ploidy. Uh, we can enjoy such a bigger fruits uh, products in agriculture. So, uh, like these days, a lot of those uh, strawberries are all tetraploid, uh, and that's why the strawberries are uh, the fruits are bigger, and watermelons are also, and many other fruits are like at least tetraploid. Some of them are, and kiwis are too. So, some of the hey, banana and also watermelon. Among uh, watermelon, watermelons are regular watermelons are all like a tetraploid, but some watermelons are triploid. And like I said, this triploid, when they have a seed, how can you have an exact half the number of? Uh, haploid of half the number of a triploid, you can't. You are going to end up 1.5 n. If you had originally 3 n, reducing those n number into the half to produce a gamete like a seed, okay, you will end up 1.5. There, there is no such a thing like 1.5 n. So that's why uh, the, this is seedless watermelon because. Uh, they originate from triploid, that's why they are sterile, seedless. So we can enjoy the more convenience of this seedless uh, watermelon. That's how they were being developed deliberately, intentionally. And bananas are too, because bananas are all triploid, so they cannot really bear viable seed. Impossible. And some of the potatoes, sweet potatoes, are even hexaploid. Wow, huge duplication of the chromosome. So bottom line is, uh, most of these uh, plants uh, that we enjoy today, uh, uh, most of them, almost all of them, are polyploidy. And because of those polyploidy, that's why those fruits are bigger. And I'm not really sure more tastier, but they are at least bigger. Okay, and in, what about the animal? Only one, I think, one, only one or two cases have been reported that this tetraploid, like I said, in animal, the offspring, like having individual having like more than diploid number of chromosome is extremely, extremely difficult to survive. Uh, but on a very rare occasion in South America, um, rodent like this uh, species, uh, like mouse like uh, this animal is uh, surprisingly it is uh, tetraploid. Okay, temple of speciation. I will skip this temple of speciation, so let's not, let's forget about this. So, in the next session, we are going to continue on this now in the final chapter as a final. Uh, chapter of this evolution, we are going to take a look at the, uh, what about the case of a human, human evolution. So let's take a 25 minutes break.